So we've, if you're visiting with us, we've been uh, marching rather rapidly through Mark's Gospel. And this morning is, I think, week 18 or 19 or something like that. I've lost count. We've been six months in this thing. It's been good. Um, and we've kind of got, we're getting bogged a little bit in Mark uh, 13, which I knew we would because it's such a big topic. And so what I'm trying to do with this scripture is give us an understanding of what apocalyptic literature sounds and looks like, how it communicates to us. And that term, apocalyptic, is simply uh, prophecies of disaster, I guess, in its purer form, but it more specifically points in the Bible towards the, the last days. And so we're looking at that this morning. And uh, like I said, my favourite topic, I don't do a lot of this stuff, but it's important and we need to do it. And so last week we looked particularly at apocalyptic liter literature in the Old and New Testaments. And I suggested that what takes place with this kind of prophecy is that it's recurring. In other words, you'll get a recurring theme that might begin in, say, the book of Daniel, and then it'll be picked up in the Gospels and expounded on further in the book of Revelation. So it's really hard to have a hobby horse with last day's teaching because people tend to take one verse and, and over amplify it. So really important, guys, that when we go through this kind of literature, um, we're actually looking at a big picture. This is why we encourage you to read the Bible. It's so important. Genesis to Revelation, every word is spoken, the spoken word of God. So it's important we do that. And if we're to understand prophetic, apocalyptic literature, we've got to give it our full attention. So you can't just take a lazy approach to it and start predicting who the beast is and so forth before you know what that stuff is. Otherwise, it'll be the Pope, it'll be Donald Trump, it'll be insert the person you do not like. And we don't want to do that. And so we're not going to do it. We looked last week particularly at one theme that I said definitely recurs throughout Scripture, and it was a good example, um, and that was found in Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. This is an interesting text, and people always want to put their spin on one verse. But it says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Let, uh, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, you might remember I said that this particular theme occurred several times. It's mentioned a hundred times in the Old Testament, that term. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a prophetic event that's actually taken place twice in history already. And we also look to it because it will take place again in the end, in, in, a, in one form or another. But this theme was prophesied in the Old Testament, specifically in Daniel verse 27, and then twice again in the New Testament. In the first fulfilment of it, which took place about three or four hundred years after the prophetic word in the Old Testament, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, wouldn't you love to have a name like that, uh, entered the temple on, on December the 16th, 156 BC. So we know that this is a solid event that took place. And this Greek guy set up an idol and an altar to the god Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, and literally sacrificed swine on the altar. There was pig's blood everywhere. It was a bit like prayer breakfast Wednesday morning when we go to Balthazar and everybody feasts on bacon and eggs. This thing was happening everywhere. This is not a Jewish breakfast, so it's not the kind of thing you do. And so it, brought, it desecrated the temple and it literally brought the, brought the abomination into the temple. And so that was prophesied in, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And then um, the text we've just read from in Romans thir uh, sorry, Mark 13, 4, was also uh, fulfilled in AD 70. And so when Jesus brought that prophecy, there was a generation. Within that generation, the, um, the prophecy was fulfilled. And this took place when Titus, the general, the Roman general, entered the temple and defiled it. Again, it's a very well-documented historical point. The Jewish historian Josephus said that the Romans brought their standards 
into the temple. This is why we don't have flags in Southland, guys. You know, a standard is a flag and it's an abomination that causes desolation. So we don't bring them into the temple. And so that took place. And um, on the standard, on the Roman standard, were all these blasphemous statements about God. And so what took place when they brought the standard into the temple, the Roman soldiers proclaimed Titus as king of kings in the temple. So there was the abomination that caused desolation. So Mark chapter 13, 8, Jesus described the process then leading up to the day of the Lord. And he described that process that would be like birth pains, ever increasing in both frequency and uh, intensity. And we looked at that metaphor in a little bit too much detail last week, probably. And so the metaphor describes what we can expect in the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. We're going to see the frequency of these events increase and the intensity, like birth pains. In fact, Mark 8, verse 13, at 13, verse 8, sorry, it says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. And so that will continue right to the end. I want to look a little bit further this morning and excuse the graphic. You know, I've, I've used a lot of poetic license in this. It's, it's something out of Star Wars. But that is a representation of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. As I said, this took place in 70 AD. And it was an apocalyptic event. It was prophesied and fulfilled 30 years later. And it effectively marked, it was apocalyptic because it marked the end of temple worship. It was effectively a full stop on the Old Testament. And from that point on, uh, the sacrificial system was finished. So let's pick the text up in Mark 13. And again, we around here at Southland, we, pre we prefer to, to use scripture when we're preaching. And so you'll note that if you're a newcomer, uh, we use lots of scripture because I don't trust myself beyond the scripture, to be honest. I say dumb things. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. And so it's always helpful to go back to scripture. Mark chapter 13, verse 15. And it says, Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Now that's a description of the kind of urgency that we're looking at. So it may not be a literal description. And again, with apocalyptic literature, you can't take everything literal. Now I know that's almost blasphemy in an evangelical church. But there's so many things that come into play. There's metaphors, there are pictures, there are prophetic examples, and they're all intertwined. So we've got to unravel that. Verse 16, let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those last days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those will be the days of distress, unequaled from the beginning. When God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. And even to the detail, the, uh, the desecration of the temple in 70 AD took place actually in spring, in summer, in the lead into summer. And so that prayer was answered. Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived through this period, recorded that around 1.1 million people were killed in the process. In, the, in that destruction of the temple. And then you have people that come to us and say, do you believe in pre-post or, you know, amillennialism? It really doesn't matter. These people got killed. Whether it happened at the return of Christ or after it or before it, doesn't matter. These people died. And the majority of them uh, were Jewish. There were about 97,000 Jews captured and enslaved the city was absolutely ransacked and the second temple was stripped and destroyed and became a pile of rubble. All this took place within 40 years of the resurrection of Christ. So it all took place within a generation. As, as I said before, with most apocalyptic prophecies, there is often a relatively short period before they are fulfilled. And then there's a longer-term ongoing view, the birth pain syndrome. As well as the, uh, the short-term, there is that long-term. And so in this case, 
Verses 20 through 27 describe then the ongoing, the unfolding events, um, those signs that will take place between 70 AD and the return of Christ. That'll be the period we're living in. And so we pick that up here in Mark 13, verse 20. Sorry, I must have uh, skipped over that one. So we're on verse 20. If the Lord had not cut short those days... Now, again, interesting. I don't know about you, I'm not a great student of literature, but I can see that that's in the past tense. And so uh, prophetic literature, again, tends to mix the tenses. We've got to be really careful when we're reading this stuff. And it's as if, when you think about it, if it's prophetic... It's as if you're in the future looking backwards sometimes. And so if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. Verse 23, so be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following that distress, and he quotes from Isaiah, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Verse 26, at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And verse 27, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So that is kind of the background of the destruction of the temple and the prophetic mood coming out of that. And what we see within that context is that there are several signs. And signs are just that. They're not it, but they're pointing to it. So the sign is pointing to what is yet to come. And so when we see these signs, we see what we can expect in the wake of the destruction of the temple. Some of these signs have already been mentioned, and they were in Mark 16, verses 6 through 13. Firstly, it says that we're going to see many false Christs. Now, that's been a significant part of, of history, really, hasn't it? People claiming to be the saviour in one form or another. And even before the coming of Jesus, there were many people presenting as Messiah. So there was a short-term uh, fulfillment and there was a long-term fulfillment. Then it says there'll be wars and rumours of wars. These are all signs. It also predicts international turmoil. Hello. As if we're not seeing enough of that. Then it says the gospel will be preached to all nations. Guys, we are living in the most amazing and incredibly exciting period of history because the gospel is now being preached more rapidly than at any other time in history we've almost reached every people group in the world with the gospel in one form or another whether they've received it or not is up to them completely but the gospel is being preached it's happening all around the world we are just a little bit shielded from that here in australia because we're a bit complacent we've had the benefit of having had the gospel preached right from day one. In fact, it's embedded in our constitution, for better or for worse. And so the gospel will be preached to all nations. It also predicts this one, and we usually duck this one and let it go through to the wicket keeper. But it predicts, predicts the persecution of Christians. Now, on that subject, when we think about whether Jesus comes before, during, or after the tribulation is, as I said before, it's reasonably irrelevant. Because regardless of whether we go through the, um, the, through the tribulation, we're going to be persecuted. Not only that, but it's happening now. It's happened in history, right from, through history in the last 2,000 years. And so that, to me, is a moot point. The persecution of Christians is a very big reality. And then it says that there will be breakdown of family. There'll be rebellion, children rebelling against their, their parents and so forth. We look at that and think, that sounds pretty trivial on the big scale of things. It happens in our house all the time. But this is an increasing phenomena. And in the West, we are badly infected with it. Kids from a very early age are taught to question, which is not a bad thing, 
but the uh, the way in which kids go about that generally nowadays is getting more and more disrespectful old guys like me notice that so the breakdown of the family is a very real thing and then we will also experience the hatred of the church by the world again hello this is happening in our very day and age isn't it it's part of where we're at and then in mark 13 the next section from verse 27 through uh 21 to 27 uh, Jesus reiterates the rising of false Christs. He mentions that one twice, so that's an important one. And then he adds that there will be signs in the heavens, the shaking of heavenly bodies. I want to touch on that a little bit towards the end this morning, but that's an important one as well. He also mentions the gathering of the elect from the four corners of the earth. Now, many see the formation of the state of Israel and the gathering of the Jews from around the, the earth as being the fulfillment of that. Again, this is a recurring prophetic event. And so when we see that, we should be reminded this is also part of the, the birth pains. It's a recurring event. From time to time, there's an ingathering. It's happened before. It happened after the Babylonian invasion of, of Israel, um, which took place 8th century BC. So this is a recurring thing. The Jews come back. There's a regathering of the elect. And then the final conclusive fulfillment in this prophetic passage is the most important. And it's the visible and glorious return of Christ. You know, as Christians, really, that's the one that counts. The rest of them, we're going to go through that stuff anyway. It's just part of the journey. We're on the way there and we're going to encounter a few twists and turns. But the big one is the visible and glorious return of Jesus himself. And so again, Jesus, in this passage, uses some imagery. He, uses, uh, he borrows from the Old Testament that gets plugged in. He uses the imagery of, of the uh, childbirth. And then he inserts here in verse 28 that, remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the fig tree. You might remember that. If you didn't, you need to look it on YouTube, look it up. But Jesus goes back to that lesson in, uh, on the fig tree and in verse 28 he says this, Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And as I mentioned, my read on that is the uh, the short-term fulfillment of the prophecy that took place with the destruction of the temple verse 31 he says heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away now as i said a few weeks ago we looked at the fig tree and we um, hopefully agreed that it represents the spiritual condition of israel and so that was like a sign when the seasons come and go of of the condition of israel here in this example, Jesus is simply using the fig tree to show us that it goes through seasons. And we know that when the twigs begin to thicken up, remember I said they have two harvests, figs. The first one is on old wood. The figs are small and not so good. The second one comes as the weather warms up and usually well into summer, the uh, figs break out. And Bill gave us a great example because he's got some beautiful figs that really take off in summer and they taste beautiful and and so when we look at the fig tree we see the summer we see the seasons coming and going jesus here is simply saying watch the seasons look at what's happening and read them read them and understand that the time is near we're in the end times now again jesus used the fig tree i believe here as a prop it was used to measure the last chapters of redemptive history. This time he compares the seasonal changes in the tree and as a reminder, simply as a reminder to watch, keep your eyes open. Verse 31 is particularly interesting because it indicates that the momentum in the end will gather very quickly. The eschatological birth pains, again a big word, it means the end times. The birth pains of the end will culminate with the second coming of Christ. That's the big event. 
That's the one we're waiting for. He says in verse 30, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. You see, this has always been a puzzling text because clearly the Lord has tarried for 2,000 years. And so this generation is both a reference to those who would be alive when the temple was destroyed within the 40 years and it's also a reference to those who would be alive when the end comes. Because in the very end, in the end of the end, the last days, this thing's going to move very quickly. It's not going to take a long time. Again, apocalyptic prophecy has both a near and distant application. And so it's, we've got to be very careful when we see a phrase like this generation that we don't misapply it and, get, and mix ourselves up and get misunderstood. The important point to note here is that when the end comes, guys, it's going to be decisive. And it won't matter what the abortion bill was at that point. It's all done. Game over. Finished. It's all finished. Jesus says that the hour is unknown. And although we're encouraged to look for signs of the end, we can't predict when the end will come with any accuracy. So why is it? that Kurong and all the other shops are full of books on the topic. I don't know where they get half that stuff from, but it's fanciful, many, most of it. So I would encourage you guys, when you are looking at apocalyptic literature, take a big look at it. Take a long look. Go Old Testament, New Testament, look at the fulfillments that have already taken place, and they'll give some kind of indication as to what the future looks like, but they're not going to give you the end date, unfortunately. That's the one everyone wants to know. And they're not going to tell you who the Antichrist is either. I think we'll probably know that when it happens. You see, again, history has repeated itself, hasn't it? There have been many Antichrists during history. And they've risen up. They've come against the church and against God. They've been blasphemous. We mentioned last week Hitler, the obvious Antichrist that uh, lived in many of our days. Uh, but he wasn't it. And so we go on here in Mark 13, 32, um, to see that we don't know the day or the hour. Jesus says this, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. Do not, do, you do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Obviously, the man who uh, went away was Jesus, and the servants left in charge were you and I, the church. And eventually, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to hold us to account. In the meantime, he says, watch, watch the signs. Verse 35, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. You see, being part, part of being a Christian is a call to vigilance. We're not only called to watch for the end time signs, but we're called to, um, to do the works of the kingdom. We're called to fulfill the works of the kingdom. Because the other flip side of this coin of ever-increasing evil is that there's also ever-increasing power. You see, Jesus hasn't left us in a world to deal with this stuff with not the right tools. And so where we may observe at different times in history the church getting weaker, the long-term pattern is that it's actually growing. God is going to... There's going to be ever-increasing breakings in of the kingdom of God and outpourings of the miraculous. And we've got to be equally on guard watching for those things. You see, you can watch for the negative or you can watch for the positive. I want to encourage you to get on this side. Weight yourself on this side a little bit with one eye on the other bit. But at the end of the day, guys, we are in called to be inclined towards the ever-increasing... Uh, miracles and breaking in of God's kingdom that takes place in the last days. And so part of being a Christian is that vigilance. It's being fully employed in the work of God, not being unemployed. There is no dull system in heaven. 
You see, I'm sure that God knows that if we knew all the dates and details of the return of Christ, we'd behave differently. I know that's true. I know it's true of me. I'd have the bags packed. I'd be squeaky clean. I wouldn't have sinned in the last 24 hours. I'm pretty sure I could handle that. Probably I'd have to padlock myself down somewhere and lock away the, lock the liquor cabinet and all those sorts of things. But there's an urgency in our message and it mustn't be underestimated. We're called to be vigilant. I want to just go back and touch a little bit, as I promised before, on understanding biblical prophecy. Um, we're, we're not going to do a major thing on this, maybe the book of Revelations for another day, but this is, this is part of it at least. The book of Revelation, by the way, was also called the Apocalypse of John. That was, that's its kind of real name, and the Revelation is, is kind of a nickname, I guess. And it describes, in part, what the last days will look like. It also describes what the new heaven will look like. And so it gives us a sense of anticipation. You see, whenever we pray for the sick, we have our eye on heaven. We're looking towards the new Jerusalem. We pray for the sick because we know that in heaven or in Jerusalem, in the new heaven, there won't be any sick people. And so that's our form of faith. That's where we take faith from. Jesus says this in, um, in Revelation 21, the, the resurrected Christ. He says, I did not see a temple in the city. Now, this is the experience that John's having, but Jesus is dictating to him. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Now, it sounds really very nice and poetic, and it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling about what heaven's going to look like. But there's more to this scripture than that. There will be no temple, there will be no sun, there will be no moon. Remember, apocalyptic scriptures, both Old and New Testament, describe an end to the temple, the destruction of the temple. wonder why that happened, because we're not going to need it. Remember, Jesus said, you'll destroy this thing and I'll raise it up in three days. He was referring to himself. So there'll be no temple, there'll be no sun, there'll be no moon. And what that tells us about apocalyptic scripture is that it's leading us into that place of perfection. Firstly, Isaiah 24, verse 23, it says, The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. You see, what we should expect throughout redemptive history regarding the heavens is that they start to shake a bit. They're on notice. They're not going to be required. Do you get it? This is not just a sign for us to look for the next blood moon or the next eclipse and think Jesus is returning. It's got nothing to do with any of that stuff. This is very descriptive and it does use some poetry. But, you know, poetry doesn't make the truth any less. All it's, what it's telling us is that the arrival of Jesus will eclipse everything. It's a prophetic picture of the coming of Jesus. Even the moon and the stars and the sun will lose their light in comparison to what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Remember I said before, the next big event is the coming of Christ. Mark puts it this way in verse 24, but in those days, following that distress, referring to all of what we said before, the persecution of the church, the hatred of Christians, etc., all those things. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Again, they're put on notice. What this means is Jesus is returning. You are no longer required. Your job is terminated here and now. And so what we expect during this next period leading up to the return of Jesus is that we're going to see those things visibly taking place. And it's not some great astrological event. It's not going to be Halley's Comet that takes the world out. It's not even going to be climate change, guys. I'm sorry. It's going to be the visible return of Jesus. And the bottom line is, these things will not be required. There will be a passing away of the old. We can't imagine what the heavenly Jerusalem is going to be like. 
All we know is that it's going to be such glaring light that we're going to need new eyes to cope with it. It says, at that time, we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. You see, when Jesus said in Mark that we're to watch, I think that's what he's calling us to watch for. And I believe that whenever we pray for the sick, whenever we tell someone about Jesus, whenever we go to the poor, whenever we represent him in any way, we're called to look for the Son of Man breaking in, for his coming in glory. I don't particularly want to pray for anybody on the basis of anything else, to be honest, because I don't think it's going to work. You know, it's a bit of a flip of the coin and we'll give it our best prayer and see what happens. But when we're looking towards Jesus, guys, we can have confidence that he's breaking in, that the stars are already starting to shake. You just can't see it. I wonder why they twinkle. That's just a theory. That's a pathetic theory, but there you go. There, there's, there's an anticipation of the return of Jesus. As the end of the age draws near, we should expect an uptick in the breaking in of God's kingdom. In many ways, through healing and deliverance and prophecy and miracles, the end of the age will be a terrible thing for the world. You see, there's two sides to this coin. But for you and I, we say, come, Lord Jesus, bring it on. Please come back soon. In fact, this is what John says in Revelation 22. And by the way, these are the last two verses in the Bible. He says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. That's the end of the book, guys. There ain't no more after that. When It's going to be so good when Jesus returns because the word of God will be with us. He's done that once. He's dwelt among us. Now we're going to be with him forever. And in the meantime, there's a whole bunch of work to do. So you can choose to major on all these prophetic books that fill Kurong up with all their different predictions of who the beast is and when this happens and when Israel plugs in and whether it's pre, post or amillennial, I don't really care about that stuff. All I know is that this thing, is the signs are there now. The return of Christ is imminent and we as his church are called to cooperate with him. So that's what I'm calling us to do this morning. We're going to do a bit of cooperation. Let's stand.